Hello, we are here for week two of Beloved Bride. I have just been through Hurricane Burl, <laughs> where I had a tree fall on my house. And oh man, it has been quite a week, but we just got our power back on yesterday. And so uh, at first I thought, man, Lord, did you know this was gonna happen when I was <laughs> gonna be teaching this? But as uh, he always does, he's, his will is so perfect. And as I thought about it this past week, it, it just correlated perfectly with what he's showing me about truly belonging to him. And one of the things that the bride knows once she is married, there's a, in the ancient Hebrew wedding, what happens is the bride is still living in her father's house, her father's house that, that she has grown up under and she's lived under this name and, and, and in submission to her father. But once that bridegroom comes, she completely belongs to him. And so even though she's still living in the house of her father, she knows in her heart she's being prepared to go to the place where she is going to live for the rest of her life. And so her life here, and just like our lives here in the earth, are very temporary, but our hearts and our minds are set on the place where we're going. And this past week is... I was here and I was in this home and it was so uncomfortable without power. I live in Houston. It's like a hundred degrees uh, with the heat index and boy, it was so hot. And not to mention we were having to out work in the yard and it just, I completely thought, man, how am I going to get through this and not even having a real place to come in and cool off. But at the same time, the Lord was just refreshing my heart so much. And I knew that he would supply. It was like every single moment I, I didn't think I would make it, he, there would be something happen that just keep me hanging on. And uh, a neighbor came and offered us their generator so we could get uh, a portable AC and have just a little air. It's just so many sweet things that happened this week to show of God's faithfulness along the way and I thought about that and I thought about us being the bride and how much that parallels to this that you know the Lord in the Bible it calls it calls our bodies an earthly tent this is just a temporary dwelling preparing us for eternity um, he calls us um, you know into a camp this is like a long camping trip camping trips are fun but not really <laughs> they're hot and uncomfortable and and something where you can enjoy but you know there's a sense of man I'm sure ready to go home and I'm sure ready to take a shower and that's exactly what it's been like this week and that's exactly what it is for us as the bride of Christ we're just on this temporary camping trip here that's preparing for us eternal weight of glory as we are prepared and made ready for our bridegroom Christ Jesus and so with that I want to pray for us as we get into week two. And um, speaking of camping, there's a lot of information here. And so I may break this up into two videos because it may get kind of long. And so I'm going to just begin and just follow the Holy Spirit's leading as I do this teaching. But I just want to begin with prayer to say, Jesus, thank you that you are our faithful bridegroom. That our faith doesn't rest upon us. Our faith doesn't rest upon anyone but you and the power of your Holy Spirit to keep us. That the one who came for us is the same one who's showing up for us. Lord, I pray that you would anoint our eyes to see, anoint our hearts to know and to understand what we can only understand with your help. And I just pray for you to help us be the bride that you came for. That we would fully become who it is you made us when you purchased us upon the cross. We love you, and I just pray for supernatural eyes to see, supernatural ears to hear, supernatural hearts to know. And we thank you, our beloved bridegroom, for making us one with you in the power of your cross. We love you, Lord, and we just ask this in your name. Amen. So, the first 
place I want to start is actually to let you know what happens. Like, how does this wedding thing even work? And so there's actually an ancient Hebrew wedding. There's actually two parts to the wedding. The first part is called the Ereson, where it is, um, and that's what we're going to be kind of going over today, and then we'll get into a little more detail as we go. But there's a second part, which is the Kedishuan, which uh, means holy, set apart. Um, the Ereson, it actually means sanctification, and so much of this in your faith journey is going to make so much sense as we go over this and see it through the lens of an ancient Hebrew wedding. The first part of the wedding is the sanctification. And boy, can we resonate with that because we know that the sanctification is that part where we become someone we have no idea how to be, yet we're also becoming that bride that as we go, and that sanctification is something that we are, but yet we're still becoming. It's the right now, yet the not yet. And that is our whole earthly journey is this sanctification. And it's so cool to know that there's actually a word for that in Hebrew that, ha that ties in with the wedding. So as we discover this, and the more and more I learn about ancient Hebrew roots, the more and more I'm like, whoa, <laughs> everything in the Bible is so clear and makes so much sense. And what Jesus did is so real. And so the how the ceremony begins is that the father of the bridegroom will take his son and they will go to the home of the bride and they will bring with them a few things the first is a skin of wine and uh, we'll discover more with why um and he will also bring a large sum of money which is uh, the bride price he's also going to bring with him a, a gift for the bride called the matan um, he's also going to bring ketubah, which is the betrothal contract. It's the new covenant um, and the promises to the bride written on it. And he's going to bring a wedding cup. And uh, so the father of the groom is going to go to the house of the bride. Um, he's going to offer, um, he's going to first do business with the father of the bride and let his intentions be known that we are coming for this, uh, for your daughter. We, we would love for her to be our husband's um, uh, bride. And they're invited to the table and the bride gets a choice uh, in the matter. And so uh, the bride is presented the ketubah. Uh, she's, uh, if the father agrees to what's being offered, he, the first, the, the father of the bridegroom drinks from the wine the son drinks the wine, the father of the bride drinks the wine, and the cup is then held to the bride. And she gets to decide if she will drink from the wine. And beloved, that is so much what happens. We, God doesn't force any of us to follow him, but he offers us the cup of the new covenant of his blood. It says, I died for you. I love you. I want you but this choice is yours. It's not your father's, it's not mine, it's yours to make if you will be one with me. And so it, it was then and so it is now. And she, if she chooses, if her answer is yes, she doesn't even say the word yes, what she does is turn that cup over and says, fill my cup. And I don't know about you, but that is so, joyful because we know that us as Christians, when we turn our cup over and we say, yes, we want to belong to Jesus, what does he do? He fills us with the new wine of his Holy Spirit and we are filled. And so that is the exact same thing that happens with us. I, I bet like you, not many of you like me, uh, knew that what I was actually doing when I was filled with the Holy Spirit was becoming one with Jesus and actually being married to him. So this is so exciting as we look at this through the lens of an ancient Hebrew wedding. So did Jesus come to our house? So we can look at John 1, 9. It says the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. And I love how the Amplified Version says it in John 1, 14. It says the word Christ became flesh and he lived among us. And we actually saw his glory, glory that belongs to the one and only begotten Son of the Father, the one and only Son who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, who is 
full of grace and truth and absolutely free of deception. There is no deception in Jesus, none whatsoever. He is completely true. And I don't know about you, but in this day and age when I can't look anywhere without seeing deception, <laughs> there's just becoming more and more awareness of how precious that is, that we can belong to the one in whom there is no deceit. It's just a beautiful gift that we get to be his and be in this world, yet not of this world, as we are his bride. Um, and so is he with his father. In John 14, 8 through 9, we find out, yes, he was. When Jesus, um, Jesus is, uh, Philip is saying uh, to Jesus, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father. It is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and so you do not know me? Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So when Jesus is God, yet he came in the flesh as the Son of God and be, to become our only way so that he is the perfect representation of the Father. He worked in perfect, humble submission to the Father so that he is, when we saw him, we saw the Father. Every move he made in the flesh, he was actually in complete submission to the Father. He had to be perfectly in the flesh to represent us, but he had to be in perfect obedience to the Father to represent the Father. So that in, in Christ Jesus, we have Son of Man, but also Son of God united in one. So when we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father because the same faith that he gave us to walk with him in obedience he first demonstrated in walking in full obedience to his father that he did not perceive that his equality with God is a, a reason to boast, but he laid down his life as a servant and stayed submitted to the father, even to the point of death. He was tempted in all ways, yet without sin, so that he qualified as our savior. Yet he bore our weaknesses and he stayed in perfect obedience unto death. The father of the groom, that was then offered the father of the bride, the bride price, the cup that he drank and gave and gave that cup to his son to drink. We know in John 3.16, it says this, that the God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And we see the father giving us Jesus as a son who was the bride price blood paid. Um, if you think about in the garden, we became eternal beings. We were, we were in the world, but we were never of the world because we were united in perfect unity with the holy God. And if sin had not come into the world, we would still be united with the perfect God and the holy God. But yet sin did come into the world. And so there was a barrier between us and the Father because of sin. Yet in the very beginning, the Father knew he was going to pay this price for us so that we could be united back into this oneness with him. And Luke 22, 41 through 45, it says, and this is about Jesus, as he was drinking the cup that it cost him to actually pay for us, his eternal bride. It says, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and he prayed saying, Father, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And he rose from the prayer and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping in sorrow. Now we see the father in this because we know that Jesus at that point was having a moment of weakness and he actually didn't want to drink the cup. But his heart was to obey the Father more than to obey what his flesh was show, showing him at that moment. So we can see from, right from here that the will of the Father was with Jesus. And so yes, the Father and the Son came together and they both drank the cup. As we know it would be to, for the Father to see his Son going through agony like that. He definitely drank the cup of sorrow as well as Jesus did at that moment. At this time, he determined in his heart to marry us. The groom took full responsibility for his bride at this moment, even to the point of laying down his life for her. 
the bride price was our sin. He had to, he had to uh, pay it to the Father, God, so that, so that he could marry us. If not, we would always see ourselves not through the eyes of our Father, but through our beloved bridegroom or our beloved bridegroom, but we would see ourselves through the eyes of our original father, which our original father, who we are before we're purchased by Christ, is sin. We're sinful. We're not able to be married to God because there's nothing about us that's holy. There's nothing about us that's sanctified. We cannot be joined with God if we are in sin. And some of us need to think about this and remember this because sometimes we say to, in our hearts, we say, oh, I'm just a lowly sinner trying to make it. But yet, if we are the bride of Christ, we could not be married to him unless what he did on the cross was real. And if what he did on the cross truly did make us righteous, in order to be married to him, then who are we to believe who we are over who he says we are? We are the righteous blood. We are the righteous bride of Christ because his blood truly did purchase us. And I want you to think about something. Jesus is in heaven right now. And when he came back from purchasing us, there was something different about him that had never existed before in all eternity. And that is his scars, his scars on his hands and on his feet, on his side. He came back different because you know what? He was different. He had become one with us. One day, 10,000 years from now, we will look at Jesus and we'll see those scars and we'll remember that there was once a time when he had to pay a price to bring us into heaven and to be eternally united with him. And those scars are real to him. He can look at his scars right now in heaven and know that I am one with my bride. So can you look at your heart and know that it's different and know that you are one with your bridegroom? <laughs> because it's just as real to us. His scars are on the outside, but our his spirit in us is on the inside. And it's real, beloved. And I want to give you permission to believe that it's real right now. Because sometimes it's so easy to look around and to feel like this world and the weightiness and the deception of it is more real than what actually did to purchase us out of this world, even while we're still in it. But there's no time for that anymore. This is for such a time as this, we are here. And what we need more than anything, more than ever, is to believe what he did on the cross is real and it's real in our hearts and it's real in us and we really are the bride of Christ who is made ready this is there's never been a greater time to actually believe in the reality of who we are in Christ Jesus our beloved bridegroom the price paid was our sin he uh, he had to pay it to the father so he could marry us so we could actually see the truth of who we have become in him Notice that he drinks before he, she does. He says, I've sealed my commitment to you even before you say yes to me. And this goes with Romans 5, 8, where it says, but God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So there isn't the weight of if God does this, then I. No, God already did everything that we need. The choice is you. Will you actually believe in what he did for you? Will you actually let yourself be one with him? And Luke 22, verses 14 through 18, talk about this. And uh, Jesus is talking about this moment when he's actually going to become one with us. It says, when the hour has come, and this is talking about the Lord's Supper. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Do you know that Jesus is waiting to eat with us? And that's actually the second part of the wedding, which we're going to get into later. But this is an awesome revelation. And he took the cup when he had given thanks for it. He said, I take this cup and divide it amongst yourself. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And Jesus is waiting to have this feast with us when we get to heaven and celebrate the second part of the wedding, which is to come. <sighs> it's so cool, isn't it? It all makes sense when we think of it. And so he's, um, and so at that point, once the, once we, 
drink the cup. We are married and we are one with our bridegroom, even though we're still living in the same house of our original father. Um, and uh, I want you to know it's not like when you're just engaged here. This is not an engagement. When the bride drank the cup, she was covenantally married to this man, even though she was not living with him. And so it was with her, so it is with us. The covenant of our marriage with our bridegroom is completely real. It's legally binding. That means legally who God says you are is more real than anything else in this world, who anything else in this world, your past, your present, your future, it doesn't matter. Who he says you are is law in heaven, and the law in heaven is the law, and it overrides everything here on earth. So that covenant that you united to is real, and it's binding, and it's eternal, and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and it is sealed forever. It's a done deal. So the full responsibility of the weight of your life is now been transferred not onto your shoulders but onto your bridegroom's shoulders because the one thing about the hebrew wedding uh, which we're going to get into in a little bit when we talk about the ketubah is that the whole responsibility for the bride once she drank that cup spiritually uh, legally uh, emotionally physically everything about her was his responsibility so that if he were a true bridegroom even if she fell away and she wandered and she like did all kinds of crazy stuff and was an unfaithful bride because he was a faithful bridegroom and he had taken responsibility for her as his beloved bridegroom I mean as his beloved bride the weight of her sin had to be paid for by him so that he had to die to pay for her because he had she had become one with her with him and because he was recovering it's just like as if a father uh, has a child that uh, hurts someone or does something the father is the one that goes to court and has to pay because that child is under the father's covering we the bride are under our bridegroom's covering and so that is one of the reasons Christ had to go to the cross was to pay the bride price for us because we are the unfaithful bride but he is the faithful bridegroom <laughs> and that is such good news such good news Romans 8, 29 and 30 say, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So it truly is finished. Who we are is already a done deal. We may not see it yet, but in heaven it's already illegally binding and we are already becoming who it is he's made us to be. Our job is to believe it and to receive it and to make it our own in our hearts. If she drank from that moment, she was married. As Matthew 19 says, Matthew 19, 6 says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. This marks the end of the first part of the wedding, the erison, and the beginning of the wait for the next part of the wedding. So what the bride would do after this portion of the wedding, uh, one of the things that would actually happen is um, he would tell her, he would actually put a veil on her, and he would give her a coin that would be on her forehead. Um, that was that was the price paid. Uh, there was a price given to the father of the bride, but there was also a gift given to the bride. We know that our gift is the Holy Spirit. Um, but he would tell her as he failed her. He would say, as he said in Mark 14, 3, And if I go, I prepare a place for you. I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. And John 10, 28. He says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So he's like, Jesus is saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And that's exactly what he's doing right now. He is preparing a place for us. And not only is he preparing a place for us in heaven, his sovereignty down here on earth is knitting us together and making us one here on earth. And we are his temple, his dwelling place. And so that heaven is not disconnected from what's happening. We are becoming, we are the bride and we're being sanctified as we're becoming more and more the bride. And more so now than ever, I see this bride just up 
becoming one, like being distinct and distinguished from the world. And this is our time truly to arise and shine for our light truly has come. This bride is given everything she needs to believe that this covenant is secure. She's given the mohar and the matan. The matan is paid to the bride as a blessing for her. The mohar is paid to the father of the bride for the payment of taking her out of his family. The mohar is the blood of Christ. The matan is the gift of the Holy Spirit that she's given. And it was a coin, a ring, like I mentioned before, that she would wear on her forehead. It's a guarantee that he was coming back for her. It's like if, if you give someone a deposit, you're like saying, I have purchased this. Here's the deposit. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit is for us. But it's the oneness, our oneness with Christ, y'all. And this is amazing. And we don't, if we stop and think about this, this is amazing. Like we have heaven inside of us. We have God inside of us. And so we are to actually help us be activated. And so everything we need to live this life and to truly be the bride of Christ, we've already have because we have the Holy Spirit in us. And if you don't feel that and if you don't know that, then you might ask yourself, am I really the bride? And it's not too late to say, I don't feel it. But I, and I don't know if I have it, but turn the cup over, fill my cup, Jesus, and you could become the bride. Even now, as I'm speaking, it just takes a belief and a saying yes in your heart to say, I want to be the bride. I don't feel like I have power to overcome this world. But yet, as we, he shows up, even as we come, even as we come. I know this uh, yesterday, I was thinking, how in the world am I going to get through another day like this it's been crazy but i woke up this morning and i was filled with the holy spirit we have a vbs going on tonight and i was thinking i'm supposed to serve i don't even have enough energy to get up and brush my teeth <laughs> but the lord gives us what we need as we need it and that's exactly what it is we have the gift of the holy spirit he, he will constantly give us what we need as we need it he is with us he is the width of god as we go and so in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, it says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, we were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance. It's a guarantee. It's not something you have to wonder if you have or not. You have it if you are his. Until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory, and Revelation 2.24 talks about this too. It says, They will see his face, and his name will be on their forehead. And there will be no more night. There will be no need for the light of the lamp for, of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign with him forever and ever. And he is reigning in our hearts right now through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we will reign with him forever and ever because we are one with him by the blood of the cross. The bride could look at these gifts and she could and as her justice and know that even though she was still part of this family that she really wasn't a part of anymore she still lived in the home of this family she was a kingdom bride and she had become something completely new that she had never been before it takes faith to believe that and to apply that in our lives I once met, I was at a retreat a few years ago, and I met a lady that had actually lived in prostitution for most of her life, even from childhood. And she was talking to me about how there was a, um, she lived, she came out of that lifestyle, and she thought in her own mind, like, I'm free, free indeed, like, I'm never going back. But all it took was um, her, um, I guess it was the person that would, she would, she, it was her husband, but he was also her um, pimp. And so he came in the window, looked at her, and did this. And she got up and followed him right out of that lifestyle. And she was tormented after that because she knew. Now she knew the difference. Like She knew what freedom felt like and, and how much the love of God felt like. But yet she was caught in this darkness and there was this wrestling match going on. And I don't I could relate with that because even though I'm I came out of a very dirty lifestyle and I know that it was a wrestling match to you know, sometimes you just want the wrestling to be over and you're just like, even if I go this way, I just want it to be over. 
And um, I know when I was in a health battle, I wanted, I just wanted to throw in the towel and be like, come on, like, I'm just ready to go home. Lord, I want this to be over. But the thing is, once we belong to him, we don't have that choice anymore because it's not our authority that we live under anymore. It's not anyone's in the flesh authority. It's the authority of God. And so eventually God won as he always did, does. And um, she ended up getting arrested and was on a bus back to, uh, back to Texas where she was knew she was going to end up back in this home where she had just felt like the weight, the weightiness of the life she had to become. She could, didn't have what it was, what it takes to live it. And she knew it. And if all of us feel that sometimes, we don't have what it takes to live this, to live who Christ has made us become. But yet we don't realize that it's actually that part of us that helps us Re, uh, become who we are because it's not us that ever does it it's him it's his grace but we don't know how to receive it at first and so she says that she realized that she knew what she was and she couldn't bear up under it but she also knew who he was and that even if she was worthy of giving in this towel and living a complete life of darkness the one who was inside of her was not worthy of that he was worth her completely yielding fully to him and that's what she did and she is now uh, in, living a beautiful life in ministry because she yielded to the one to who she who she belongs to who she really belongs to because in all truth who we belong to who we think we belong to is who owns us and this is so easy to slip into i know for me as a mom as a grandma sometimes i feel like i they own me more than jesus does and so I often have to check myself before I wreck myself and remember I am his first and foremost. And everything in this world can grow strangely dim and I can bear up under anything when I fully, fully am rested in the awareness that I am his. And I don't know if that helps you, but uh, that I pray that today, is, even as you're hearing these words, you're able to just say, I'm yours. And I don't, all these other people that are, I get tangled up in, I'm able to freely let go of them and entrust my life fully into the one who paid fully for me. And so um, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 talks about this. It says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, you know what we get to do with God our whole rest of our lives? We get to glorify God in our bodies. And we don't even know how to do that. But even the weight of being able to glorify God in our bodies is upon his shoulders. It's upon the shoulders of our beloved bridegroom. We have, I have a frame um, that my favorite picture from our wedding is in, is in, and it says, has the quotes from this song, all of you loves all of me. And truly, even though I love that frame, Jesus is the only one who can truly, truly say that and mean it, that all of him, literally all of him down to the last drop, truly loves all of me, all of me. And he loves all of you all of him every ounce he gave everything to have you he gave everything to have me and you to make you truly one with him and you are truly one with him in fact in in uh in the hebrew culture there's not even a word for you know how we say wife and husband you know we have different uh words for those but in in hebrew culture there isn't there's a word for like daughter-in-law, son-in-law to distinguish them, but not for wife and husband because even to make a word for them would separate them. And that what God has joined together, let no men separate. So you are one with him. Even your name is one with him. You're going to be given a new name in heaven and I will be given a new name in heaven that no one knows except for him and you. Sorry, it's kind of loud out here with all this stuff going on. But uh, anyway, I wanted to share that with you. And so I wanted to just say, what is our job now? Because sometimes we just got to know, like, what am I supposed to be doing right now? So this is what the bride's job was. She was to believe in what she, who she had become. And part of her working out that belief, they would call it unleavening yourself. And so what she would do as she was in her father's house, she would get rid of everything in her uh, surroundings that wasn't coming into her new life. And if 
And if you ask me, that's what our job is to do right now, is we're to take with us the things that we're going to take into eternity and everything else we let go of. And we're letting go of and we're letting go of. Her other job was to make her wedding dress. It says in Revelation that um, our dress is being knit uh, with the righteous deeds of the saints. Wait, we talked about this last week, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But our wedding gown is being knit together with the righteous deeds of the saints. For it was granted to her to clothe herself in white linen, the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, we don't have any righteousness to, uh, to, to brag about or to make anything out of. But we have the righteousness of Christ. And as we trust in his righteousness over us and for us, he takes that and our lives begin to operate in, in his authority and his righteousness. And that is actually weaving together in eternity a, a gown for us that we will wear in heaven. And so that is beautiful. So the, our job is to keep on shining. We live in a world that is darker now than it's ever been. But we are to keep on shining. And so... Um, before Christ, our ketubah was our Ten Commandments. It was the Ten Commandments written on hearts of stone. But now we have been given the heart of Christ, a heart of flesh. Um, 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 says that you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So as we're going through this journey and be becoming more and more his bride, he is writing his story right through our lives. It's just like he talked about us abiding. We're the branch, but he is the life that flows through us. And we are coming from him, through him, and to him are all things. And we are becoming more and more his as we go here. So the husband has the aggressive part of taking full ownership for his wife, but we have the submissive part of responding to and keeping what he has allowed us to become. Uh, it talks about this in Ephesians uh, verses 22 through 23. So I'm going to go there really quick in my Bible and read it. Um, 23, 22 through 23. Okay, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, himself its Savior. So right here he's talking wedding language about the bride of Christ and Christ himself. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives must, must submit to their husbands. And because the marriage is here, if we always think about our the reality of our marriages here as being so big and that we think about almost like happenstance, like, yeah, but we're the bride of Christ. But it's actually the opposite. Our marriage here is the real. This marriage here and what's happening is, a, you know, for some of us, a slight and momentary affliction. It's hard. Marriage is hard. I've been married 20 years. It's super hard. But as I go and I keep submitting to the Lord and sometimes I just have to keep my eyes solely on Jesus and just remember that this is temporary. This is the camping trip, but this is where I'm coming home to. And boy, this marriage here becomes so beautiful and so bright. And this marriage here is making it all worthwhile because it's preparing me for the eternal weight of glory. This marriage here is the shadow. This marriage here is the dream. This marriage here is the dreamer. and We are God's dream. And a lot of times, well, I know for me personally, my marriage here is the greatest tool Jesus is using to prepare me for my marriage there. I don't know if that blesses some of you, but for me, that's how I live. That's how I breathe. You know, sometimes it's just hard. You know, marriage here on earthly realm, for some, I'm sure it's, it's 
beautiful and wonderful. For me, I come from a background of mistrust of men. So everything is a battle for me to just have the faith to keep trusting that he's got it and he's working it all out and to keep passing it over to him and to just keep believing that this, whatever I face here, whether it's in my marriage with my kids, with the world and the darkness all around us, he's preparing for us eternal weight of glory beyond all we could ask, think, or imagine. So keep shining, my sister, keep shining. It's worth it. It's worth it. Um, also in Ephesians 5, it gives, Paul mentions this right here. I'm just jumping ahead to verse uh, 31 in the Ephesians 5, where it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a mystery, is profound, and I saying that refers to Christ and the church. The two shall become one flesh. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So right here, this whole thing, Paul is saying right there that this earthly marriage is really about our heavenly marriage. And if we could keep that in mind, that makes everything so much easier and it makes everything so weighty because there's a weight of glory in it. And don't forget that. It's worth it. The weight of glory is worth it. We're we don't want to get to heaven and realize what we missed out on because we simply didn't believe what God did was real and what who he is in us is real. So hang in there, sister, and just keep shining no matter how hard it gets. Um, you know, it, I mentioned earlier that the, the bride would be veiled. And there's also reference to this in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, where it says, For now we see in the mirror dimly. We see in the mirror dimly because we're veiled. Remember Moses was veiled. His face was shining when he came down from the mountain and he was veiled. But right now we, we see through a veil. We see through a mirror dimly. But then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall be fully known. But then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. We, we only see in part here because right here in earth is our only opportunity we have to give Jesus the one thing he asked of us, which is our faith. And that faith is just a belief that he's real and what he did for us is real. It's faith to believe that the reality of God is alive in us and we're real in him. And boy, we don't need that in heaven because we're going to see it with our own eyes. And so then, and know, even as I am fully known, and he does fully know you, beloved, he knows right where you're at. He knows the struggle you're carrying. He knows the weight that is on you that is unbearable and you cannot bear up apart from him. And he, the only thing he asks is that you give it to him. Let him have what he paid for to have, which is you, your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole journey. Give it to him by faith because that's all he requires of us. Faith is what keeps us looking to him, even when it's so hard to see because of the weight and the darkness of this world. And that veil is gonna get darker and darker and darker. But the light that is of Christ that is in us is gonna break forth brighter and brighter and brighter until at last we see the one with whom our light originated, our beloved bridegroom, Jesus. Right now is the waiting game and our souls testify that we're in a state of waiting um, and we are not, we're in this world, but we are not of this world. And so my encouragement to you is to keep on shining, shine anyway. Whatever's going on in your life, give permission to Jesus. Just ask him in your heart, Lord, can you shine your light even in this? Just ask him. Don't trust me. Trust him. Ask him, can I shine even here? And let the reality of who he is be greater than what you're going through. There's a painting uh, of peace. There was once a contest where um, there was a contest given where the there were a bunch of artists asked to port paint a picture of peace. And there were many that painted landscapes, um, beautiful beach scenes, beautiful garden scenes. But there was one, the one painting that won was actually over a raging waterfall, a, a rocky cliff. And right underneath the waterfall, there was a little bird's nest and a mother hovering over her, her uh, chicks, right under that raging waterfall. And as I thought about that, I thought about 
you know, that that's the one that actually won because peace isn't the absence of difficulty. Peace is what comes in the midst of difficulty. And the Jesus is our Prince of Peace. Our Bridegroom is also our Prince of Peace. And we don't understand that peace unless we're in the midst of the raging waterfalls. And yet he shows up and shows, I have peace be still. I am with you. Peace be still. And I just have that to say to so many of us right now whose hearts are raging and looking around at the world and saying, how are we going to get through this? And, and wondering, and, and, and it keeps our minds wandering. But I say to you, peace, be still. Your bridegroom has you. And his love and his light is most seen in what is most unright. And as I thought about that picture, I thought about us, the bride. I thought about, man, if, when the Lord wanted to most define what it was to have himself in the world. Perhaps he thought, I will paint her in the most antagonistic backdrop to the bride of who I am. I'm gonna, there's gonna be darkness all around, but yet this pure, spotless, blameless, perfect, radiant bride, this breathtaking bride is going to be walking down this wedding aisle of blood right through the midst of it. And that is what we're doing. We are the bride. Keep walking in the blood. We're headed not towards a destination here on earth. We're headed towards heaven. But we are not able in our own strength to carve the way to heaven from here on earth. But there is a path that has already been laid out for me and you. And it's an aisle of blood with which he paid every price for us to keep on going. And we are most seen and known and distinct in the world against this backdrop of darkness. He has overcome you already and he has overcome me. And so with that, I just wanna pray and say, Jesus, thank you so much for making us one with you. Even as we're in this world, we're not of this world. We are one with you. And I pray that right now for every single one of us that is looking around this world and thinking, wow, this is just getting too much that you will lift up our faces a little higher, lock eyes with you, and let us keep on going and keep on shining. For you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy, our Lord, our King, our Mighty One, and our beloved Bridegroom. Thank you for making us your bride. Thank you for letting us be one with you. We ask this in Jesus' name, and we believe you, Lord, and we give you our faith in advance. For it's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for letting me share week two of Beloved Bride with you. I will see you again next week. Please pray for me as I know that I'm praying for you and I love you and I thank God for you. Thank you for joining me on this most precious journey. For such a time as this, we are here and our time has come. What a gift. I love you. See you next week. Bye.